Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is a prenuptial agreement okay or not? Today we have a story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Hi, I'm Jim, and I want to share my story. Sometimes when you're content, you might overlook what's really happening around you. But then unexpectedly, you discover that your wife is having an affair, and your world turns dark. JT and I are both members of a beer club in Atlanta. He recently revealed that his wife of 25 years had been cheating on him for over 24 years during one of our club meetings. One piece of advice he gave, which I ignored, was to take off your rose-colored glasses and examine your marriage. My wife Karen and I have been married for almost 28 years and have three children. Life was good. My wife Karen is the only child of Ben and Alice Thompson and comes from a wealthy and well-known family. Although she's 49, she could easily pass for 35. I'm not entirely sure if I'd describe my upbringing as middle class, but I was raised in a loving family in a small town near Atlanta. I'm the younger of two boys, and we grew up next door to my grandparents. My father worked at my grandfather's hardware store, and my brother Ken and I helped out after school and on weekends. Ken went on to attend Georgia Tech and is now an electrical engineer in South Carolina. Following in my brother's footsteps, I also attended Georgia Tech as a computer science major. Every small town has its wealthy kid, and in our case, that was Joey. Joey and I have been best friends since we were three years old. While I attended Georgia Tech, Joey went to Emory. We often set each other up on dates when we visited each other's colleges, and Karen happened to be one of the blind dates Joey arranged for me. She was the only one I called for a second date. As seniors, we spent as much time together as our schedules allowed. One thing I knew for sure was that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Karen. However, there was one issue I needed to address before proposing. I was raised to work hard and provide for my family, but Karen came from a wealthy background and had never worked a day in her life. I couldn't bring myself to rely on her parents' assistance. Fortunately, she agreed to marry me, and we embarked on our journey as an independent couple. I had saved up part of my earnings to buy Karen an engagement ring. The day after I proposed to Karen, we shared the news with her parents. Karen and her mother were thrilled and immediately began planning the wedding. Karen's father and I had a conversation in his study about my career plans after graduation. I informed him that I had accepted a job with a large corporation in Atlanta, which seemed to please him since he was acquainted with the company's executives. After spending about two hours together, we said our goodbyes leaving Karen and her mother to organize the wedding over the next 14 months while I focused on launching my career. Three months after we shared our plans with Karen's parents, Ben, her father, invited me into his study. He expressed his fondness for me and acknowledged Karen's love for me. However, as a father, he felt the need to protect his daughter and family. I sat there puzzled about what he was getting at as he handed me a document explaining that it was a prenuptial agreement he wanted me to sign. I could hear my father's voice echoing in my head, advising me never to sign anything without reading it thoroughly, asking questions, seeking advice, and giving it careful thought. I took my time reading through the agreement while Ben patiently waited. The document stipulated that if our marriage ended within the first five years, I would receive $100,000 but wouldn't be entitled to any other assets from Karen or her family. Every 10 years, the monetary limits would increase with the maximum reaching $5 million on our 25th wedding anniversary. I sat there dumbfounded, trying to figure out how to respond. After a few minutes, I addressed him, saying, Sir, I love your daughter and plan to spend the rest of my life loving her. However, the practical side of me understands your perspective. I'll take this with me and think it over. He nodded and replied, Good. I'll await your response. My father has always been my go-to person for advice, so I visited him next. Dad meticulously read through the document twice before offering his thoughts. He said, Jim, we both understand why Ben wants this agreement, and the way it's written, it primarily protects his family's interests. The real question is, what do you want out of this marriage, and what do you want to safeguard for yourself? We delved into my aspirations, emotions, dreams, and long-term vision with Karen. Dad continued. I've always believed that if someone asked you to make sacrifices, they should be willing to make some as well. 
Ben's attorney is representing the Thompson's interests, as he's paid to do. They might see you as a country boy with less to lose and more to gain. Both you and I can understand the reasoning behind this agreement. Ben may believe you love Karen now, but he's concerned about unforeseen developments down the road. If we were in his shoes, we might do the same. He paused, then added, Jim, marriage can falter for various reasons. This prenuptial covers any possible reason. Being together in college is one thing, but being a married working couple is another. Can you and Karen overcome challenges that may arise, such as differences in jobs, friends, finances, or family dynamics? Would you ever want Ben's money because your marriage didn't work out? What circumstances could lead to that decision? I'm grateful I discussed this with Dad. I also consulted my brother Ken, who provided similar advice to our father. After talking with several other trusted individuals, I knew the changes I needed to make to the prenuptial agreement and how to discuss them with Ben. During a later visit to Karen's family home, I approached Ben for a private conversation. We moved to his study, away from the wedding preparations happening elsewhere. It was there that I brought up the prenuptial agreement he had given me some time ago. I explained to Ben that after careful consideration, I had some proposed changes to the agreement. He listened attentively and encouraged me to go on. Here's what I suggested. In the first 10 years of our marriage, he would contribute $100,000 annually to an investment account. We would jointly make investment decisions and review them quarterly. I believe this would strengthen our bond. If our marriage ever ended in divorce, he would retain the money. Any assets acquired by Karen and me during our marriage would be split evenly, except for gifts or inheritances from our parents. In the event that our marriage ended due to my betrayal, Ben would keep the funds, while Karen would inherit all marital assets, excluding gifts from our families. Conversely, if Karen were to be unfaithful, the funds would belong to me, and I would claim all marital assets, again excluding any family gifts. When we reached our 43rd wedding anniversary, control of the investment account would transition to both Karen and me. I gave Ben some time to think over these terms. He seemed relaxed and expressed his gratitude for the sentiment behind my proposals. He particularly liked the idea of the joint investment but had questions about the significance of the 43-year mark and the inclusion of infidelity clauses. I explained that at 43 years, Karen and I would both be 65, an age often associated with retirement. Regarding the infidelity clauses, I clarified that while irreconcilable differences could lead to a divorce without blame, adultery represented a deep breach of trust, something I believed a marriage could rarely recover from. Ben understood my perspective and promised to draft a revised version of the agreement. A couple of weeks later, Karen was informed about the updated prenuptial terms. While initially surprised, she came to appreciate the thoughtfulness behind the clauses. After a thorough review, she asked for my thoughts on it. I confirmed my comfort with these stipulations and reiterated my reasons for them, especially emphasizing the emotional weight of adultery. Following this, Karen and I celebrated our love with a magnificent wedding followed by an unforgettable honeymoon. We've been married for nearly 28 years and have three children. Our oldest, Dan, is 26 and named after my father. He's working for one of Ben's companies, where Ben is grooming him to take over the family businesses. He's also been accepted into an MBA program starting this fall. Benny, 25, has a passion for the outdoors and joined my dad after graduating from college. As you can see, Benny is named after Karen's father. My dad is delighted to have a family member taking over the farm and hardware store. My brother and I left the farm as soon as we could. Amy, our youngest, turned 18 three months ago and has me wrapped around her little finger. She's our most talented athlete and has received a full scholarship to play soccer at UNCC next year. After our boys left for college, I converted the basement game room into a brew pub. Karen and I enjoy hosting gatherings, and the pub has become a hit with our family and friends. For the past few months, I had felt that someone might be pilfering my beer. I never maintained a strict record but there was an uneasy feeling in my gut. As I was organizing beers for a beer club gathering, I found myself short of IPA bottles. During the meeting, I confided in Fred Jones about my growing suspicion regarding my 18-year-old daughter possibly taking my beer from the pub. Fred inquired if I allowed my daughter to consume beer. 
I explained that while I did allow her a sip if she was interested, I couldn't imagine her taking whole bottles. I further expressed my observations that the beer tended to vanish whenever I was away on trips. I was sure it wasn't Karen, since I had never seen her completely drink a beer, given her preference for wine. And while my sons enjoyed my brew, they always left with a case of their own, leading me to believe Amy and her friends were the culprits. Fred suggested installing a motion-activated camera in the pub to potentially catch her red-handed. Impressed by the idea, I inquired if he could set it up. The following morning, when Amy would be at school, he proposed 11 a.m. as a suitable time, to which I agreed. True to his word, Frank was there on time the next day, getting the system up and running within 15 minutes. He also took some extra time to guide me on its operation. He wondered if I intended to inform Karen about the surveillance setup. I voiced my concerns about her possibly letting it slip to Amy, so I had decided against it. He was curious about my travel plans, and I shared that I was scheduled to visit Cleveland the next week. Before parting, he wished me well and hoped the system would provide the evidence I sought. With everything in place, we left the pub and decided to grab some lunch. Over the next two weeks, I made it a routine to enjoy a beer in my pub while checking the surveillance tape. However, all I ever saw were the cleaning crew who came in on Tuesdays and Fridays, along with myself returning from my Cleveland trip late on a Friday night. I had to spend the day at the office. In the evening, Karen and I had dinner with her parents and attended a play. On Saturday, we hosted a barbecue at our house. Sunday, after attending church, we visited my parents. When we returned home, I decided to take a nap in my easy chair. On Monday night, while Karen was at a meeting and Amy was at soccer practice, I finally mustered the courage to review the tape. Five minutes into watching the footage, my world shattered. I had expected to see Amy and her friends, but instead, I witnessed Karen entering my pub hand in hand with Jerome. Jerome, along with his wife Diana and daughter, had moved into our neighborhood about eight months ago. His daughter Nicole had quickly become friends with Amy. As I watched, I saw my wife bend over the arm of my favorite chair, intimately involved with Jerome. I sat there numb for who knows how long. It wasn't until I realized I was watching footage from the Saturday barbecue that I snapped out of my days. I deeply regretted not installing audio recording along with the camera. The initial shock I felt soon gave way to anger, which then escalated to pure rage. I remembered my father's consistent advice about tackling problems with a level head, cautioning against making decisions in the heat of anger. He had often emphasized doing thorough research, understanding the crux of the issue, and then deciding on a course of action. He believed that decisions made in anger were often regrettable. Knowing this, I was determined to gather irrefutable evidence. As I waited for the tape to rewind, I tried to control my emotions by taking deep breaths, bracing myself for another viewing of the distressing footage. It was clear from their interactions that this wasn't a one-time occurrence. The sequence showed them sharing a beer and engaging in casual conversation. As events unfolded, Jerome dressed up, Karen got him another beer, and she too dressed, all the while the man leisurely sipped on my beer. Not only had he deceived me by getting involved with my wife, but he also had the audacity to drink my beer and even take some bottles with him. I decided to consult Frank and gave him a call. After introducing myself, I asked if he had a moment to speak. When Frank wondered if I had caught my daughter stealing my beer, I corrected him. Informing that the tape had revealed my wife with our neighbor and expressed my need for his expert advice. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Frank conveyed his sympathies and inquired about what I specifically needed. I told him I needed comprehensive assistance, and we settled on meeting the next day at 4 p.m. To my relief, Karen hadn't returned home yet, giving me some time to compose myself. About an hour into my reflection, Amy approached me, and I took a moment to reassure her that I would be there for her soccer match. I don't typically avoid problems, so I chose to stay awake and wait for my unfaithful wife to return home. I can't help but wonder if she was actually at a meeting that night or if she was involved with someone else. Regardless, I figured Frank would uncover the truth. I entered Frank's office at 3.55 mentally prepared for what was about to happen. Frank expressed his sympathy regarding Karen's betrayal. I mentioned that I had spoken with JT, and he had informed me about Frank's expertise in handling such cases. 
I asked Frank for his professional advice, making it clear that I was aware of the prenuptial agreement and stressing that we had all the necessary evidence to prove adultery. I was eager to know his strategy. I was determined to gather comprehensive information about Jerome, his background, connections, and family. I wanted him to be closely monitored in every aspect of his life, as I was determined to make him face the consequences for disrupting my life. My intentions extended to Karen, and I wanted her to be under continuous surveillance as well. Frank acknowledged the extensive nature of this task and explained that it would require a significant amount of time and manpower. He assured me that the process would begin the very next day and suggested installing surveillance equipment in my home and Karen's vehicle, which I thought was a good idea. I expressed regret for not having audio recordings from the previous week and asked about my upcoming trip. Frank reminded me of my upcoming trip, which was scheduled for three weeks from then and would last for four days. He was confident that by the time I returned, a substantial amount of information would have been collected. When he inquired about the tape, I confirmed that I had brought everything he had specified. When we discussed the logistics of installing the surveillance system, I mentioned that Karen had her regular bridge game on Thursdays, which could be a possible opportunity for the installation. When he asked about the time required, I was informed that it would take about two hours. We agreed to meet at my house the following Thursday at 9.30. As I left Frank's office, I felt a slight sense of relief knowing that proactive measures were being put in place. However, the three-week wait that followed seemed endless. When it finally came to an end and I set off supposedly for Austin, I had a feeling that it was my final goodbye to Karen. Mike Ford had meticulously prepared all the necessary legal documents, which were securely stored in my briefcase, ready for the upcoming confrontation. I changed my destination from Austin to JT's place, fully aware that the following day would mark the end of my marriage. As expected, Frank later gave me the troubling news I had mentally prepared for. He told me that shortly after I left, that man had come to my house, and they had engaged in their secret affair right in her bed. To make matters worse, Frank mentioned that Karen had even invited him for the next night, as Amy would be away at a friend's house. After a lot of thinking, I decided how to handle Karen's infidelity. Although a part of me wanted to confront them in a dramatic fashion, I chose a more measured approach. The next day, I reached out to Karen's father, asking for a private meeting at his office to discuss an important matter. Recognizing the seriousness of my request, he agreed to see me that evening at 6.30. When I arrived, Ben looked puzzled. My unusual request to meet in that setting had clearly piqued his curiosity. I began by expressing my deep respect for him, likening it to the respect one has for a father. I then explained my situation, revealing my intention to serve Karen with divorce papers due to her adultery. Shocked, he asked for more details, so I told him the painful truth. I had obtained video evidence of Karen's affair with her lover right in her marital bed. To emphasize the seriousness of the situation, I added that even at that moment, they were repeating their actions. He was visibly shaken and wanted to know my next steps. I shared my initial desire to confront them dramatically at our home but then suggested a more restrained approach, mainly out of respect for him. Over the next 45 minutes, we discussed my proposed plan and we eventually agreed that it was the most sensible way to proceed. At 9.15, Ben and I convened at my residence, joined by Frank Jones, Brad Williams, Mike Ford, and Steve Collins, an Atlanta police detective. Following the introductions, Frank updated us on the situation unfolding in the master bedroom. Karen and her lover were indiscreetly involved. As we exchanged words on the porch, Frank was alerted via his earpiece about the ongoing intimacy within. Upon gaining entry into the living room, I turned my attention to Ben, suggesting he might prefer to stay downstairs, given the circumstances. It was a delicate situation considering his relationship to Karen. I reiterated that I harbored no ill will towards Karen that could lead to physical harm. As our group proceeded upstairs, Brad, equipped with a video camera, led the way. The intention was to capture undeniable evidence before confronting them. We aligned outside the bedroom, the muffled sounds of intimacy emanating from within giving us pause. It was clear they were sharing more than just a physical connection. Preparing ourselves, we made our entrance. The sight that greeted us was Karen attempting modesty with a sheet and Jerome rather ineffectively using a pillow as a shield. Without wasting any time, I began the introductions, 
Frank, the investigator, Mike, my attorney in the impending divorce, Steve, the detective, and Brad, behind the camera. The atmosphere was heavy as I explained my restraint from reacting violently. I made it abundantly clear that our home had been under surveillance, capturing every deceitful act for the past weeks. Addressing Karen, I laid bare my knowledge of her past with Jerome and her motives for marrying me. The room's tension intensified as I recounted how she had chosen me over Jerome. Primarily to appease her parents and ensure the continuity of the family line, a purpose now fulfilled with three heirs. As Karen attempted to interject, I silenced her, emphasizing the pointlessness of any explanations. The evidence against her was overwhelming, especially damning was her invitation to Jerome, recorded not long after my departure. Turning my focus to Jerome, I noted his impressive skill at deceit. I relayed how he had been closely watched for the last few weeks, alluding to a comprehensive report about his background and activities. To further the humiliation, I instructed Frank to display the findings on a DVD for the pair, especially wanting Karen to see Jerome's true colors. The video revealed Jerome's blatant betrayal of Karen, showing him intimately involved with two other women. The climax of the video was a recent dining scene where Jerome openly discussed his affairs with his friends. Boasting about continuing his affairs with married women, specifically mentioning Karen. He reminisced about Karen visiting him on her wedding day and her promise to remain faithful to her husband. After one final encounter, he scornfully remembered how she had recently confessed a desire to marry him, expressing doubts about ever considering marrying her. The impact of these revelations was immediate. Jerome became furious, accusing me, while Karen, overwhelmed with emotion, curled into herself, tears streaming down her face. Sensing the tension, Frank and Steve positioned themselves closer to Jerome, trying to calm the situation. They assured him they meant no harm unless provoked and hinted at Jerome's wife and her brothers being displeased upon discovering his infidelity. They suggested he get dressed quickly. I then informed Jerome that his past actions were now known to everyone, as the evidence had been given to his wife and the husbands of the other two women. Furious, Jerome threatened me, unaware that he had just incriminated himself in front of a lawyer and a police officer. Mike promptly handed Jerome a set of documents, divorce papers from his wife. I conveyed his wife's strong desire for Jerome to never enter their home again. In a surprising twist, I told Jerome about his brothers-in-law, who were already waiting downstairs to escort him out. Clearly not in a pleasant mood, to make matters worse, I revealed that they had played a significant role in gathering evidence of his numerous affairs. As Steve led Jerome away, I turned my attention to Karen. I challenged her to consider the magnitude of her betrayal. How would it feel knowing she was just another conquest for Jerome? What was it like to come to terms with the fact that she had destroyed our family for someone like Jerome? Drawing from our history, I reminded her of a pact we had made three decades ago. Infidelity would be the ultimate breach of our bond. She hadn't just ended our marriage. She had cast a dark shadow over every cherished memory and future family event. In the eyes of our children, our parents, and our friends, her actions made her a deceiver. Seeing her now filled me with visceral disgust, and it pained me to think that I had devoted 30 years to someone so undeserving. She appeared pitiful, lying on the bed with tears streaming down her face, hiding beneath the covers. I informed her that I no longer considered her worth my time and urged her to get dressed quickly, her father was waiting downstairs. And he wasn't thrilled about discussing her actions with Alice. I emphasized that I had nothing more to say to her and urged her to hurry. When she expressed reluctance to let her father see her in her current revealing outfit, I reminded her that she had the choice to change quickly or be taken downstairs as she was. She asked for a different outfit, but I stood firm. Her complaints about privacy were met with a reminder that those present had already seen much more compromising footage of her. The urgency was clear. The outfit she had previously worn was, to put it mildly, provocative, a sheer blouse, an extremely short leather skirt, and high heels. When I escorted her downstairs in that attire, the shock on Ben's face was evident. He couldn't believe his eyes and expressed concerns about taking her home looking like that. Worried about both Alice's and his own reactions, I was torn. I wanted her to feel the embarrassment of her clothing choice, but I also respected Ben and Alice. As the weight of the decision hung in the air, only the steady ticking of the grandfather clock broke the silence. Understanding Ben's discomfort, I offered a compromise, 
Steve could drive them home in Ben's vehicle, and I would follow behind. Then, as a final sign of respect for Karen's parents, I allowed her a brief opportunity to change her clothes. She wasted no time going upstairs and returned shortly after wearing an outfit that was far more modest, resembling that of a typical mother. Before she departed, I approached her and removed her engagement and wedding rings, stating that she didn't deserve them. When she tried to take her purse, I stopped her, insisting she would leave with only the clothes she was wearing. Ben, appreciating my earlier gesture, extended his hand in gratitude, assuring me he would take it from here. Telling the children about their mother's affair was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Seeing the pain in their eyes, answering their questions, and witnessing them cope with their mother's infidelity was heartbreaking. When Karen cheated on me, she also cheated our children out of a family. My parents' reaction mirrored that of my children. In the final update, Amy turned down her soccer scholarship from North Carolina to join the Emory soccer team so she could be closer to her daddy. Our compromise was that she could attend Emory, but she had to live on campus with her teammates. She helped me remodel the master bedroom and purchase new furniture for my pub. When she's not home, I sleep in the guest room. Dan and Benny visit and check on me more frequently than before. One of the things I enjoy the most is that they take turns accompanying me to my beer club meetings. Benny has taken on the challenge of growing some hops for the beer club. We're organizing a competition to determine who can brew the best beer using Benny's hops. I'm aware that Amy keeps an eye on me and ensures her brothers stay in touch with me. Following advice from our attorneys, Karen and I opted for a no-fault divorce. Ben agreed that I had sufficient evidence of Karen's adultery and didn't need to file for divorce on grounds of adultery to gain control of the investment fund per the prenuptial agreement. This way, Ben, Alice, and Karen avoided the embarrassment of a public trial. I did permit Ben and Alice to go through Karen's belongings and take her personal belongings. A couple of months after the incident, Karen's father, Ben, got in touch with me, wanting to have a face-to-face -face conversation at his office. This was a bit surprising since Ben and I usually just had phone chats. For nearly 25 years, he had been trying to get me involved in their family business. I had consistently declined his offers, always emphasizing my desire to make my own way rather than relying on his success. However, during this meeting, Ben brought up the idea of me joining the family business again. I quickly let him know I wasn't interested, reminding him of my long-standing stance on the matter. Ben understood my previous refusals but stressed that the current situation was different. He mentioned his age, the fact that his son Dan wasn't ready to take over for at least another 10 years, and his belief that I would naturally step in if he couldn't. He also talked about how Karen's actions had deeply affected his wife, Alice, who felt humiliated and had withdrawn from her social circle. Her therapist recommended a change of environment for her well-being. Given all this, Ben expressed his wish for me to temporarily take over his role and mentor Dan for the future. I expressed my sympathy for Alice's situation and asked him to pass on my feelings to her. I also told him that I couldn't give him a definite answer right away and needed some time to think it over. Ben understood but was eager to speed up the decision-making process for Alice and Karen's sake. He asked for a time frame for my decision, and I agreed to meet again in three days. Before we wrapped up the conversation, he playfully mentioned my habit of consulting with my father for major decisions, emphasizing our meeting in three days. Three days later, I let Ben know that I'd be accepting his offer. Dan is excited about his role in overseeing the family business, but as Ben rightly pointed out, he's still a few years away from being ready to take over. Ben and I meet with Dan, Benny, and Amy once a month to discuss family business matters. This arrangement allows Ben to stay updated on what's happening, and it provides Dan with a support system he can turn to for advice, similar to how I consult with my dad and brother. Karen moved to Florida with her parents and stays in touch with the children. Dan and Benny make several trips to Florida each year to visit Karen, and Amy spends a couple of weeks with her during the summer. Karen also attends several of Amy's soccer games but keeps her distance from me. Alice is making progress but won't be returning to Atlanta. I'm not sure what happened to Jerome, his wife divorced him, and to the best of my knowledge, he relocated out west. He was involved in at least eight divorce cases and is financially ruined. Jerome not only ruined his own life but also destroyed many marriages. I suppose I shouldn't place all the blame on him, those women made the choice to cheat on their husbands. 
They were not coerced. They plan their affairs in advance and share responsibility with Jerome. I hope to find someone to love in the future. I miss being married and having someone to hold, talk to, and share my love with. Until that happens, I'll wake up each morning, express gratitude for my children, and approach life with a forward-looking perspective rather than dwelling on the past. What do you think of today's story? I found it quite interesting, because this is the first time I've heard of a prenuptial agreement. Write your opinion in the comments. See you in the next video.